Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York State, presents Race to Represent, a MNN election initiative. Hello, I'm Julie Walker. New York voters will head to the polls on Thursday, September 13th, for party primary elections. They will cast their ballots in many statewide and local races, including for governor, attorney general, and members of both houses of the New York State Legislature, including State Assembly District 68. The New York State Assembly is the lower house of the New York State Legislature and works with the governor of New York and with State Senate to create laws and establish a budget. The Assembly's legislative authority and responsibilities include passing bills on public policy matters, setting levels for state spending, raising or lowering taxes, and voting to uphold or override gubernatorial vetoes. The 68th Assembly District covers East Harlem and parts of the Bronx. Joining us today is one of the candidates, incumbent Assembly member Robert Rodriguez, and his challenger, John Ruiz, was unable to attend for medical reasons. Welcome. Thank you for being here, Assemblyman Rodriguez. How do you describe the major responsibilities and the role of a state assembly member? Well, I think the assembly member has a number of important responsibilities. One is to represent the district locally and make sure that their um, important resources are, are arriving to our community. And secondarily is to look at the bigger picture and try to find solutions to the bigger problems, not just impacting uh, our community, but also uh, New Yorkers across, um, across the state. And I think I've been able to do that on a number of occasions. When we look at the local initiatives, making sure that public housing begins to get the resources that it, that it deserves. Uh, so far, we've gotten about $550 million over the last three years to go towards public housing. Uh, making sure we have better parks and open space, so the pier and the East River Esplanade, and making uh, sure that we get resources for that. I've put $5 million towards the restoration of the pier on 107th Street. And then also making sure that the Second Avenue subway and transportation in general improves for not just the residents of our community moving up from 96th to 125th, but also thinking about creative ways to fund the entire system so that it's better for everyone with the Move New York plan. So those are some of the local initiatives that we've undertaken that have also led its way to larger legislation. So I think being able to do those things it what may, is what makes us uh, a good assembly member to say. So other than the things that you mentioned in this last term, what were legislative accomplishments that you were most proud of? And did you have any major disappointments? Well, there's always major disappointments. You know, sometimes you never get as much as you like in a number of areas of the budget. So I would say that continues to be uh, an area. We need more money for public housing. And even though we got almost a billion dollars for e public education, um, you know, we certainly need more resources there. But we did have a number of significant um, accomplishments. And one that I'm particularly proud of is uh, making sure that we are um, uh, creating opportunities for people who do not have access to retirement accounts to be able to save for the future. We introduced this legislation two years ago um, uh, under guidelines from the Obama administration that would allow us to be able to create uh, uh, an a state sponsored retirement program for private employers uh, and private employees to participate in if they don't have access to 401ks through their employer. So, really, um, you know, we've we, we started with this legislation. We ran into some roadblocks in terms of um, directions from labor, the Labor Department on how that could be implemented. And then we ran into a bigger roadblock with um, uh, President Trump getting elected and literally the Congress rolling back all of those um, uh, regulations. But we persevered. We, we were able to uh, craft the program in a way that it does deal with uh, those regulations and objections so that uh, it clears hurdles and we are now able and passed in our budget along with money to fund this program a state-sponsored retirement program for private employers and private em uh, and employees who don't have access to retirement systems. So that's a big policy initiative allowing people to save for the future so that our, you know when they hit uh, the senior age they're not relying on just Social Security which likely will not be enough and uh, and actually have a little bit more security um, in, in the future. So that, that, was, that was a big deal that took a number of years to implement um, that, that we're particularly proud of. You mentioned public housing, and sure. we're going to get back to that in a moment. Hope but so. mm -hmm. in 2017, you were a Democratic candidate for the New York City Council for District 8. Mm -hmm. It was your second run, and last year you were defeated in the primary election. 
you remain in the assembly. How did you, why did you run for city council? Did you feel you could get more done with the city council then as an assembly member? There are two particularly different roles, and of course, uh, just reminding voters, it really matters to vote. That, that, vote, that race was decided on 80 votes, so it does matter, um, every single vote. But particularly, the, the, um, I certainly thought that I could do more on the city level. It's a different pot of resources. They're able to do a number of things locally, um, whereas on, in the assembly, a lot more of it um, is um, primarily policy-based in a number of ways, and the budgets oftentimes are decided um, uh, on the state level, but then implemented oftentimes on the city level, particularly when you talk about areas of housing. Oftentimes, you know, we'll approve our state bond cap, and the majority of that state bond cap will go to the city for affordable housing projects, and they're the ones who implement the local initiative. So it's important that, that we recognize that distinction, that the city council does have a lot of opportunities around local initiatives and implementing many of the programs um, that are decided on the state level, and we operate um, much more on a policy level I mean, our $154 billion budget is, is extraordinarily significant uh, in terms of setting priorities, and then the local localities are responsible for implementing those. So when we talk about criminal justice reform, which I'm particularly proud of with Raise the Age and the issues around ceiling, when we talk about issues around uh, health care and education funding, you know, those are things where, where the state plays uh, an outsized role in. I know I can continue to do there, but it also would have offered an opportunity to do something different. So unfortunately it didn't work out, but I'm happy to be serving in the assembly and continuing to represent my constituents because we have a number of things that we have been successful in implementing, but they're not quite done. We, uh, hopefully we'll get to talk about the Second Avenue subway, which is one of those. We will. Great. But first we'll go back to the state budget, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Do you think your district is getting its fair share of those resources? I will always say no, because I always believe that we should be getting more, because we are a district with significant need. You know, I'm proud of the work that we've done to really change the way the state looks at public housing. When we started, there was a significant gap in funding from the state, where no money had been coming in for at least 12 years. Starting in 2015, we got $100 million to start investing in NYCHA. Two years later, $200 million. Last year, $250 million. So I, that's significant progress. But of course it's not enough. The numbers that are needed there are huge. Um, we made progress in terms of making sure that we preserve Mitchell Lamas. Again, a, a similar situation. We started off with small funding, I think around 15 million, and we're able to grow that pot uh, last year to $75 million to preserve Mitchell Lama housing across the state. And successfully we're able to do that for places like Lakeview. So I, I think you know, we have been able to bring significant resources, and I know we're going to talk about the second time you saw it later, which is probably one of the biggest accomplishments with $1.2 billion to begin to start that program. Um, so we're doing fine in terms of getting our share of major projects, but is it enough? No, because the need is so significant in just three of those areas that I mentioned. So what do you think was left out of the state's $168 billion budget? Well, I think one of the areas that, that we are going to see ourselves faced with, and uh, I hope that I can continue to advance that conversation, is transportation funding. MTA is and will continue to fall apart unless we take aggressive measures. I've been the chief advocate for the Move New York congestion pricing equitable tolling proposal, which generates revenue but also creates a fairer um, uh, distribution of the costs associated with, with transit um, and also raises a significant amount of revenues. I think we can get to about 12 to 15 billion dollars to help fund uh, the improvements that are necessary in terms of the subway action plan and major capital projects like the Second Avenue subway. We took a baby step last year in terms of implementing just the um, uh, for hire vehicle surcharge, which was only one of the parts of uh, the Move New York plan that I, that I had been championing and proposing. Um, but I believe we are going to come back um, next year and really uh, address and fund some of the shortfalls that we're seeing with respect to the MTA. So more work to be done there. Well, we know that the lack of reliable public transportation and access to public transportation services is a serious problem in your district. According to the MTA, phase two of the Second Avenue subway, which extends the Q line three stops to 125th mm -hmm. Street in East Harlem, is now expected to finish in late 2029. So what plans do you have to address the lack of public transportation in this district? So that's been a huge issue. First off, we contend that 2029 is too late. We believe that we can get it done by 2027. 
MTA uh, um, believes that that can be moved forward, but we all have to be pushing aggressively, both on the state and federal level, to get the resources necessary to make that happen. Um, and also looking at um, the issue of, of, of transit, improving bus service, and improving reliability of the subway. 80% of my residents rely on public transportation to get to doctor's appointments, or to get to work, or to get your kids to daycare, and we know that if anything were to happen on the four, five, and six, which is by far the busiest train line you know, in the system, the east side is completely out of business, completely disconnected. People are stranded and walking to work, missing work. So having the redundancy, but also the access and availability is critical to our, to our residents. And that's why we've put so much time and energy into making sure that it's funded. And that's why Move New York and that, and that discussion is important is we want to fix it, not just so that we get 2nd Avenue subway to 125th, which is critically important, but because we deserve and everybody deserves a better MTA with better access points. And I think we can do that with some of these resources. Let's move on to talk about Rikers Island and criminal justice reform. Sure. Are you for or against the closing of Rikers Island and moving the inmate population to borough-based facilities? And is 10 years too long to accomplish this? I think it is. I think we recognize that there's a significant problem with Rikers Island, one that um, is certainly requires newer and better facilities. Um, I think they're completely outdated and very much the way that we deal with and house people there is significantly outdated. That's why I think we begin to address the bail reform issue because there are people there who have not been convicted of a crime who are literally there because they can't make their bail um, and, and for, for minor offenses. So that's something that we tried to address this year that I think we need to, we need to continue to uh, push to address next year. Um, but more importantly is making sure that there's a rational position to where we move um, uh, inmates so that they are in their communities able to receive services and in their places that are supported by the community and I think you know uh, uh, it's important that that conversation also happen because I think there's a significant amount of controversy about people uh, assuming responsibility and sharing um, the burden. Do you have a plan to move those inmates? I think uh, that is a plan that is currently we're still waiting to see from uh, from the city uh, and particularly the mayor. Uh, but do you have your own thoughts on it? I would say uh, you know our thoughts are you know we one is to significantly reduce the 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 population which raise the age something that we passed begins to do and um, bail reform would significantly lower that amount. I think when we look at places like our district we have Lincoln Correctional which um, you know, if we're dealing with those minor offenders, particularly on the on the bail reform component, can assume a little bit more responsibility uh, there, as well as another facility in Central Harlem up on Edgecombe that could assume some of those responsibilities. So I think from the Manhattan Upper Manhattan perspective, you know, we're we're certainly doing that. And then I think if we were going to look at the mentally ill population, you know, that needs significant services around that, we do have Manhattan Psych on on Randalls and Wards. Uh, that is currently underutilized that we, we could consider um, for helping to reduce that population. So that is specifically how we could address our share in my portion of, of the Assembly District. And you know, I, I certainly would hope that um, you know, the conversations in the other boroughs are hopefully as fruitful and productive as the ideas that I proposed. So yes or no, do you support Assembly Member Dan Court's bill to end cash bail? I do. Okay, and let's let's talk about marijuana because marijuana plays into this and the legalization. Where do you stand on the legalization on any level of marijuana? Now, I am for decriminalization. Legalization will take a little bit more steps. I feel the conversation that's being had right now is very much about the financial benefits associated with the legalization of marijuana. My primary concern has been around the criminal justice component. You know, I represent an area that had the most number of stop and frisks, you know, uh, amongst its youth population. So we have put many people, you know, through the system, many of whom were co um, uh, convicted for a minor violation for possession of a, a minor amount of marijuana, which should have been a violation under any other circumstance. Um, so those folks have been run through the, through the system. So I'm concerned about making sure that we decriminalize it completely and then you know let's talk about how do we do that and 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 provide some sense of justice for those people that have been targeted for 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 decade for almost a decade as a result of this practice and then you know we can you know i'd like to have a conversation based on that viewpoint not on the fact that this is going to generate x amount of you know billions or millions of dollars in revenue um you know for 
uh, an industry that you know is has that may benefit others, but you know has not provided any substantial benefit to my community thus far. So, getting back to NYCHA, the New York New York City Housing Authority operates more than 15,000 apartments in 21 developments in East Harlem, and that's the largest number of public housing apartment units in any of the city's community districts. And it's also a large portion of East Harlem's affordable housing stock. Mm -hmm. So the living conditions in public housing have been the subject of many investigations in the last few years. And to say that they are deplorable is not overreaching. When was the last time you were in a NYCHA apartment in your district? Well, that would have been a week ago <laughs> because we are out there campaigning and knocking on doors. And um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, the governor in an apartment with us looking at the conditions in tapped houses, in particular looking at the level of mold, looking at how the issues are, are around the floors, looking out uh, about, uh, look at how poor the repairs uh, are, are, are and the timeliness uh, in which they are being done. Literally, it's not just about the level of investment there. You know, having been at Lehman Village last week and talking about the elevators that consistently do not work, you know, we could go development by development around the problems in each and every one. Um, and, you know, having been through them, you, you recognize that this is a big problem that needs a big fix. And while I mentioned earlier that, you know, we've gotten half a billion dollars or $550 million, you know, to begin that discussion, other parts um, uh, had to be incorporated into that legislation to make it more effective, like design build so that we can maybe get these repairs and big contracts done faster, like a monitor to make sure that this money is not wasted and we are not wasting time on change orders and other, uh, all this other nonsense that tends to blow out projects and take out time. Those were part of the, the, the legislation that we passed uh, in the budget last year. But, you know, more importantly is in the future, you know, we have been fighting since the day I was elected to make sure that the state plays a more active role and steps up to investing in, you know, the, the tens of thousands of units I have in my district, but the hundreds of thousands of residents across the city. You know, we can't say it's somebody else's problem. They're New York City residents, New York State residents who pay New York State taxes. So I think, you know, I, I want to continue to work on a bigger picture solution that puts some significant capital to match, you know, uh, the city's contribution in how we fix public housing. Because I don't think the federal government is going to be there, even though in this last budget, they did make a, a significant increase from previous budgets. So going to affordable housing, rents mm -hmm. have increased 40% in the past three years and private development is taking off. The city recently rezoned much of the neighborhood with plans to invest over 200 million and allow for the construction of nearly 3,500 new apartments, about a quarter of them designated as affordable housing units. Do you support this rezoning? I thought the rezoning could have done better in terms of increasing the number of affordability uh, units and making sure that affordability is across the spectrum. And I think that's you know, an opportunity that is, a, is lost um, uh, because it's only on a, a conditional basis should they choose to, you know, take, to take the increase in, in zoning. And I, I think, and, and what we fear in the community is that many of the folks are just going to develop as of right. And, you know, this, this would be a benefit that, you know, is, is, is not taken advantage of. So I think that's one of our concerns uh, with respect to the rezoning. And that only represents new units coming online. You know, there, there are significant threats around existing affordable housing units. And that's why preserving those Mitchell Amas, preserving those affordable units, you know, we did 400, we preserved 440 units at Lakeview. Um, by making that a project-based Section 8 program so that we don't lose those units um, in the, over the next 20 years. Keeping the 1199s and the Franklin Plazas of the world, which represent the heart of working class communities, of the working class community in our district, to keep that affordable is critically important because if we lose any one of those large developments, then you know, it will dwarf whatever we think we're going to be creating out of that rezoning, and I think that's one of the, the long-standing concerns that we'll have to work through. Earlier you mentioned retirees. How do you plan on supporting the needs of the growing number of senior citizens in your district? I think that's where the subsidy programs become critically important. You know, we have worked uh, consistently to expand DRE uh, and, and to expand SCREE, which is the Senior Citizens Rent Increase Exemption Program. We've raised that threshold um, to $50,000, uh, which 
covers more uh, seniors. I think that's going to be an another important issue, is making that available for those areas that are not Section 8 um, based, that are not um, uh, New York City housing development base where you have um, income subsidy. We've got to be able to expand that potentially to other places. I, rem um, I was knocking on doors and I spoke with a woman um, at 1900 Lex, for example, and she is retiring this year. She's currently paying, you know, three, $3,100 for a three bedroom, two bath. She knows her income is going to drop precipitously when she retires. And she is concerned about how she's gonna pay for that rent. So we have to get her scree or some form of subsidy or there is threat that she's gonna be homeless. Assemblyman mm -hmm. Rodriguez, mm -hmm. what is your next piece of legislation you wanna sponsor if you're voted back into office? So I think um, where, where we're going to continue to to work is in the Secure Choice Savings Program. Uh, I think you know for us to be able to get that implemented again. I don't like leaving jobs half finished, you know, and there's certainly new legislation um, to take on. But I have a number a number of things that are kind of underway. Uh, getting the Secure Choice Savings Program up and running and activated, and actually getting um, uh, the enrollment to meet the demand. Is, is, is something I want to focus on. And then, of course, MTA, you know, the Move New York um, initiative, creating real long-term funding for that. I, I, I think that will uh, um, take up the majority of, uh, of the legislative um, time because these are great things that need to happen that I hope will happen quickly. And then we can, you know, certainly look at that. Unfortunately, still, still things that in my mind are not quite finished. Okay. Well, well, we are almost finished here, and mm -hmm. we would like to get your closing statement. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to have represented East Harlem and the Upper East Side for the last eight years. Having been born and raised in East Harlem, spent my entire life there, and uh, volunteering on the community board till the day, uh, till here we are today. Um, you know, I'm proud of the accomplishments that we have been able to achieve. Money for New York City public housing. Uh, money for affordable housing to preserve those developments that we have. Expand the transportation ac access initiatives that are currently underway. I feel locally like we have been able to bring significant resources to our district as well as pass the signature items like um, raising the minimum wage to $15, making sure that there's paid family leave. And I have two children, so I feel it, um, the impact of, of what making sure you have enough time to, um, uh, to take care of your loved ones, uh, particularly um, you know, when, when it's most necessary for your family unit, making sure that those things are there. Um, raising the age uh, of, of criminal responsibility so that our young people, are not, uh, their lives aren't ruined in jail for, for, for a mistake. We have done so much good work, universal pre-K to name a few, and I could really go on and on, but really uh, it's important about making sure that we continue the work that we're doing. I believe that we're moving in a direction where East Harlem is getting more resources. We have uh, initiatives underway for better parks and open space, better transportation, better and new housing, more senior developments. And I don't want to see us lose this progress. I want to be able to continue to build upon it. So I ask everyone to come out and vote on September 13th and support the direction moving forward. Assemblyman Rodriguez, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Please remember to vote. Primary party elections will be held Thursday, September 13th, and the general election will be held on Tuesday, November 6th. For more information on voting, locating your poll site, and all the candidates, you can visit racetorepresent.com or the League of Women Voters website, lwvny.org. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network.